มันมีไงบ้างก็พอไลน์ใจเป็นความมันคนที่ความเย็นเนี่ยบางทีมันดักันใบหลายทีเนี่ยบางทีแต่แต่ชอบทำเกี่ยวกับการเงินอย่างแรกนี่ดีนะความมีแต่กับที่ก็รวมดีอะอุตสาหมนต์อะไอทีอะไรอะไรขนาดที่เรียกว่าก็เป็นมันเดิมทีเนี่ยจะได้ทำตัวความเย็นเดิมเราควรดูเรื่องราวของการเงินดิจิทัลสตาร์ทอัพเลี้ยงเกษตรซีรีส์ฟอร์ดิสมิ่งเซชั่นฟอร์ไฟเอ็กซ์นะนะทุกคนแล้วก็เป็นอะไรแต่งกับอาชีพแบบเทคโนโลยีมิชชั่นคือดูอะไรดิจิทัลเซชั่นออนไลน์เองแต่ที่ว่าดิจิทัลฟอร์คอมเพล็กซ์ไฟล์ลอจิคัลเซชั่นเป็นอะไรก็ต้องมีการอินเทอร์มิชชั่นฟอร์ดิสเนี่ยเป็นการทำแบบไฟล์ลอจิคัลไฟล์ฟอร์ดันเดลเซชั่นฟอร์ดสมันเซชั่นก็อันนี้ที่ฟังเที่ยวพีเอสพีแอนด์แอนด์เอแต่แต่คนเล็กก็มีการเรียนแบบวิทยาศาสตร์ประกอบเรื่องนี้ในอเมริกาในฟอร์ดิวกันครับ Thank you everyone for coming for the talk so I am uh, I I'm an engineer by training but I started my PhD in bioinformatics and You might be wondering how was that transition from computer science and engineering to uh, working with biology. And as most of you, uh, uh, similar to most of you, I also studied biology uh, before my PhD, only for my uh, ordinary level exams, like that little bit of uh, biology that you do for uh, your O levels. So. Let's see how uh, engineering and biology can come together to find uh, interesting solutions. Okay. Okay. So this is a little bit about me. So I'm a PhD candidate at the Australian National University, which is in Canberra, and. I'm currently a visiting student at the University of Melbourne at the Optimization and Pattern Recognition uh, Research Group. I'm supervised by Professor Saman Halgamge, uh, a distinguished uh, Sri Lankan academic, uh, affiliated with both uh, ANU and UNIMEL, and uh, also by Dr. Mani Shaw of ANU and uh, Dr. Senlin Tang of uh, Academia Sinica, Taiwan. So, out of my uh, supervisors. Uh, Dr. Senlin Tan is the biologist. He uh, is a researcher at Academia Sinica, uh, the, a very prominent uh, institution in uh, Taiwan. So, uh, before we go into the biology, I would like to talk a little bit about data. So, I'm sure most of you know uh, about Sherlock Holmes, and he apparently said. That it's a capital mistake to theorize before one has data, and if we theorize before we have data, what will happen is we will twist the facts to suit our theories. But what we should be doing is we should gain the facts first, and uh, we should make our theories which are accordance to the facts. So that's uh, that I believe is what data science is about. It's about uh, getting the facts first, and then. Theorize something. <coughs> so I'll try to get rid of this bar. So let it be there for now. So this is a, a plot of a story. So what do you see when you get a story? A story is all about. Little details. So, basically, I would call them facts. A story is a collection of facts or a collection of data. And each part of the story has some data to go with it. And likewise, um, if we look at a data set, it might not be apparent at first, but there is a story hidden there in that data set. And our task. As a data scientist or a computer engineer, or is to retrieve that story, or uh, which story? It, it's, it's the story which makes the most sense. That's the story we have to retrieve out of the data. So this 
may sound a little bit abstract, but when you think about it, uh, rather than thinking about the specific algorithms, it makes sense for us to just look at some data and see what that data represents. For example, if I ask you all to guess an object, say I would say oh, it's, it's round, uh, it's, it's red colored, it's edible, what do you think that is? An apple, yeah. So, see, like that, you, uh, you are able to uh, get the concept behind that data. So, that's what we do with data science as well. Except the data we have might not be that obvious. So, that is the challenge in data science. So, there's this quote like once is chance, twice is coincidence, and thrice is a pattern. Okay, so uh, I'll say that this, this thrice is figurative because uh, we can't make anything out of just three facts, but uh, that we need a sizable amount of data to get some facts. So for example, look at that diagram there. Um, what can you say when you look at this diagram? It's, it's just ran, like two random dots, can't really get any sense out of this. But if I do this, do you get a little bit more information out of that? So you can clearly see that there is a separation. There are, if we are looking at a data set, we can say that, oh, there are just two groups of data. So uh, that's how we make, make sense out of data when we have a lot of data available. Uh, especially my research is uh, mostly focused on uh, unsupervised learning and, uh, and clustering of data. So that's why I'm going in uh, this approach. So, and also when we, uh, when you are trying to get that story from the data, it's important that how we look at the data. So this, this is again like, a, will be a little bit abstract for the next uh, like, 10 minutes or so, but uh, I hope you'll find it interesting. So what do you think this is? Any guesses? Sir? It's a brick. Any other ideas? So it's very hard to guess from this picture, right? What if I show you this picture? Can you now recognize that the first picture is the roof? Right? So how we look at the data matters. And if you look from the wrong perspective, we will not get that story behind the data. So uh, as you can see, the first picture is uh, two dimensional and this, the second one is uh, sort of a 3D reconstruction, but even in the 2D, uh, in, even in the two-dimensional uh, world, we can actually represent uh, this house. Like, if you look at from this angle, we can clearly see that it's a house. So it's not about the number of dimensions uh, available to you. It's about using that in a way that our make, our data makes sense to you. So, but also uh, even the the middle diagram it's also it's also in 2D. So uh, when we are when we have uh, a limited number of dimensions, we have to make sure that we convert our data into a way that we can make sense of it. Let's uh, get a little bit uh, more abstract. So this is an interesting uh, geometric shape and you can see that uh, when you look at it from different sides, you, you see totally different things. So that's quite similar with data as well. You never know what is the real thing when you look at the data. And when you, especially when you get a data set, it's just a lot of numbers. So what does that mean? We have to figure out. So these are some things we will keep in our mind going forward into this uh, seminar.
to when we are looking at the data, we'll see all of it. Is there any other way we can look at it? Okay. <clears throat> this is an actual uh, example from uh, data science. So, has anyone heard of this data set before? So, this is called the, the Swiss raw data set. It's like a Swiss raw. So, let me ask you a question. So, there's these points one, two, and three. Which point is closer to point one? Three. It is closer to three when we take the Euclidean distance, right? But when you look at this uh, data set, what, what is the what's the pattern you see? That it goes around. So, what should be the point closer to point one? Two should be the point cl uh, closer to one, right? So, but if you are just looking at this representation, uh, all we have here is the Euclidean distance and we will end up with the answer uh, number 3. But that is not what we want. So, how can we do something about it? So, what if we convert this data set into uh, what is shown in uh, figure B? then we have a more uh, uh, intrinsic representation of the data. That is, uh, if, if I am to explain the term intrinsic a little bit better, that is what the data was supposed to mean, rather than the uh, ambient representation which is uh, what, what we see. So, this is about going from uh, the figure in A to the figure in B. So, this is what uh, we want to find out how to do this. And also, uh, when it comes to data science, we are more interested in the patterns we, we can't see. Because if the pattern is uh, so obvious, then you don't need the, us, the data scientists to uh, do something with the data, right? So, we are interested in the hidden pattern. So, we are interested in, in seeing the hidden. So, I'll I'll take you to a, another interesting uh, example. So, when we look at this, you can see that there are red dots and green dots, right? And if I ask you to separate the reds from the greens, you are able to do it. Yes, I assume. But unless uh, you are color blind, then you can't separate uh, the blue, reds from the blues. So I actually had a, a colorblind friend who could not distinguish between red and the green. Anyway, so what will you do if we are asked to? So now we are looking at these pictures, uh, assuming that we are all colorblind. And there are red dots and green dots. How will how will you uh, separate them? So I think we have red balls and green balls. Well, this is in the physical world. We have a red box full of red balls and green balls, but you are colorblind. How are you going to separate them? Uh, simple ideas work. Yes? With the help of a? I can't hear. Ah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. That's that's exactly the answer I have here in my slides. So we ask for help from a friend. And if this is our data set, and if we can't see the pattern hidden in it, what do we do? We, we ask help from a friend, but this friend comes in the form of uh, algorithms and tools. So th this is the approach uh, I like to take when I'm given the data set. I like to think that the algorithms I have are my friends and sometimes I can't do something and I ask my friends to help me to understand the data set a little bit better. So, yes, 
let's go to another example. I hope you are not tired of my abstract examples. So, uh, when it comes to clustering, it's mostly about uh, dimensionality uh, reduction. So, we are looking at a 2D uh, graph here on the left hand side left hand side yes. and on the right hand side we are looking at a 1D representation. So in the 2D representation we can clearly see separate clusters but so this 1D representation is when uh, we project all these uh, points to the uh, x axis right. In the one dimensional image we can't figure out the clusters. But uh, so this is uh, very like similar to the case of our data sets where we have a lots of dimensions and I don't know about you guys but the most I am able to make sense of is three dimensions. Some people say they can make sense of uh, four dimensions, five dimensions but I'm not like that. So I have to at least get it down to three dimensions to make sense of it for myself. So. Uh, this is going from two dimension to one dimension. So, what if we do try to achieve something like this, where even in the single dimension they are packed together, the, these two clusters. So, uh, this is a, an important uh, problem uh, our research group has been working on. One of the things our research group has been working on. Uh, so, yes, how do we do that? One of the simple ways is to look at neighbors. So, uh, let's take, uh, I had a point, I'll just get a point. So, let's get like one of these dots and uh, see the other dots around it. So when we look at the distance, we can think of the probability another point is going to be neighbors with it, right? So let's get these two points. What do you think of the probability of them being neighbors? Quite high, yes. And what about this point? and this point quite low. So when we are going through the dimensions it's hard to go from like distance to distance because some of these distances are not uh, like it's physically impossible to represent dimensions in the, uh, the distances in the two dimensions in just, sing just a single dim dimension. So we look at the probability. So we get the probability of each of these being neighbors and we come up with the probability distribution. Right? And we try to achieve this similar probability distribution of uh, each data points being neighbors in the single dimension. And then we use the second probability distribution to come at, uh, to achieve uh, a distance metric. In that way we go from here to here. So that's a, it, it might not be a very clear first, but it is a simple way of uh, going from a high dimensionality into a lower dimensionality. And I have to show you another uh, interesting algorithm uh, found by an, another Sri Lankan guy of a more University of Morocco graduate. Damit Senayanaka, some of you might know him. So he came up with this algorithm where you do dimensionality reduction, but not just uh, a static data set, but when data points are incrementing uh, progressively. So he came up with this algorithm where uh, you can continuously add data to your data set and it will learn better and better as you add more points to data uh, and uh, cluster themselves nicely. 
So these are some of the algorithmic approaches. So now, uh, if you guys uh, have any questions on the algorithm side or the uh, abstract uh, problems I posed to you, I will take some questions now from this section. Okay. Yeah. Yes. So our next uh, two parts is about biology. So I wanted to uh, give a background on data science before moving on. So this is uh, where we talk about biology, and I really like this quote where it says biology is engineering. So this may seem very <coughs> contradictory, but if you look into biology in a different way than what we are used to from uh, ordinary level science or advanced level uh, biology, this is a very interesting way of uh, looking at biology. So what if I say biology is the study of design, function, and construction and operation of a machine, or this machine being the human body or uh, other organisms. So we are studying the design and we are studying how it functions. Uh, and we are, we are trying to make sense of what we are given uh, our bodies or the environment around us. That's what we are doing. That, that's why uh, this philosopher uh, called biology is interesting and also interesting uh, in biology you can see uh, optimization quite a lot uh, evolution itself is about optimizing so if you are an engineer you can look at biology in a completely different uh, point of view rather than uh, accepting what someone says about uh, a certain uh, system in the human body or something like that you we can take an approach where we try to understand what's going on. So and then I'll jump into a little bit of uh, biology. So feel free to uh, ask any questions if uh, you are not familiar with uh, these things because uh, it's not uh, something uh, we are trained in as engineers. At least not all of us. So DNA. So everyone knows. Uh, Everyone has heard about DNA, I suppose. So DNA is uh, sort of the coding uh, on how every organism is made. So your DNA makes you who you are, right? So when we talk about uh, biology as a computer science scientist, that's what something uh, which we are interested in because it is the code behind us. If we understand the code, we can basically hack it. We will obviously not be doing anything uh, that uh, advanced. We will we'll just try to understand a little bit. So what you need to know for the purpose of this talk is uh, some very simple things. So DNA as the coding or the specification of an organism. and Physically, DNA is a, is a polymer of uh, some different types of acid. I have no idea what they are. They are represented by these uh, letters A, C, T, G. So they, they do represent something, but we are not interested in what it represents. But we know that DNA is like a string and it can be sequenced by using a machine. And what we get after the after the DNA goes into the machine is a sequence of strings and that string is the data which is available to us and that's all what we are interested in and uh, next thing we are looking at is uh, chromosomes because uh, I'm looking at chromosomes here because that's 
more easier to understand than going into the gene level. But so this DNA is this a uh, this is like double helix thing, and it is packed in chromosomes. So we have uh, 23 chromosome pairs in uh, our bodies, and that's like the subsections of our DNA. So each of these chromosomes have something they are responsible for. And the most uh, famous of these are the X and Y chromosomes, because they, they determine the sex of a person. So two X chromosomes means it's a it's a female. Uh, X and Y means it's a it's a male. <coughs> this is a this is common to uh, almost all uh, mammals, I I believe. And there are uh, similar things for uh, other animals as well. So. And uh, something about uh, chromosomes is that chromosomes can usually give an indication of some uh, illnesses. For example, uh, I guess uh, you are all uh, aware of uh, Down syndrome. So Down syndrome can be identified by looking at the chromosome. So in, in the case of Down syndrome, there's two duplicate copies of chromosome number 21. We will not go into details of such things, but we will know that, moving on to the next slide, we will know that chromosomes play a big part in understanding what is going on in a human. So uh, we will look at uh, a question and we will try to see how we can solve this as engineers. So when someone is expecting a baby, knowing uh, the gender of the fetus is uh, something uh, most people are quite interested in and so we assume the problem as uh, finding the sex of a fetus at an early stage so how do we go about doing that i know we can do with uh, ultrasounds but we are looking at a different it be, uh, at an early stage because i think i have some details here about ultrasounds so ultras you have to wait like 18 to 20 weeks uh, to get an ultrasound apparently uh, but uh, chromosomes or your DNA is uh, determined to write at the instance where uh, the fetus is made so why wait until uh, that long so we'll uh, try to say whether there's been a way to find this so Okay, so what do we know? What do we know <coughs> about the fetus and uh, about a, like how a baby is made? Uh, as engineers, what do we know from our ordinary level uh, knowledge of biology? So, do we know that uh, the blood of the fetus goes through the <coughs> body of the mother? That's how there's a connection uh, through the placenta. So that's how the uh, the fetus gets the oxygen and gets rid of the carbon dioxide. So, so the the blood of the fetus goes into the body of the mother, and we know that there's DNA in blood, right? So, if the fetus's blood is in mother's blood, then fetus DNA must be mother's blood and we can take a blood sample right and if we have a blood sample of the mother theoretically we should know uh, everything about the baby because the baby's DNA is there but what could be the problem Yes, exactly. So that's that is our biggest problem. We don't know uh, what part of it is mo mothers and what part of it is uh, fetuses. Um, so th there has been some research. Yeah, I should have skipped this slide. Yeah. So there has been some research, and it shows that only ten percent of uh, uh, the DNA. <coughs> 
in, my, uh, in a blood sample is from the fetus. And uh, yes, so we should be able to see some of it, but we still can't separate uh, what is uh, mother's DNA and what is uh, the baby's DNA. So we look at an example data set. So what we have when we sequence the data is something like this. I will explain this and if uh, there are any questions, please ask. So I, I'm very happy to uh, go through this slowly. So we get different samples and for each sample we have different regions and what we get is a number on how much of how, how many reads from a sample has been mapped to that specific region in uh, the DNA right and these regions can be uh, like it depends on the data we are given but um, the usually it comes in a one mega base pair base pair is a uh, is a unit for DNA it comes in one mega base pair resolution and if it comes in one mega base pair resolution we have around uh, 3000 regions so how many dimensions is that 3000 dimensions and we can't really make sense of the 3000 dimension so again to uh, repeat so each sample has uh, 3000 numbers here so that is 3000 dimensions we are looking at that is where we need to uh, get help from one of our uh, algorithm friends and something which can be useful here is dimensionality reduction right I was talking earlier and if you look at uh, the neighbor the probability of neighbors in a 3000 3, dimensional world and if we can map it to a two dimensional world and get that neighbors then we might be able to do something with it and um, as I said before can we do that with just one data set no so for example we, we know that in, in this uh, specific biological scenario we know that uh, basically if we get a lot of samples we can expect to get two distributions one being male and one being female that's our expectation right uh, but if you get just one data point it will not work if you get two still no so if you get around like maybe 500 then we'll probably see a, a distribution because we know that in in the world the, the in newborn babies the ratio is almost like one to one for male to female ratio so we know that we have an expectation that it will divide into two groups and but because we are uh, because we will be comparison comparing between uh, different samples what may what can we do something uh, we all do in uh, computer science or the engineering fields when we have different data sets when we want to combine them together uh, we can normalize it so normalizing is an important part in any problem so definitely every data set you get you normalize it and uh, because uh, of this high, very high dimensionality and especially when it comes to biology there's there can be a lot of uh, uh, the word, uh, there can be a lot of noise in it because uh, in, in biology the data we get can be clouded because of so many factors um, and the data we get is not the precise numbers we are looking we are used to be get almost an approximation so because this uh, because of that this data set could be quite skilled so we can do a log transformation as well so 
we normalize this and apply a log transform and I will show you some actual results uh, an abstraction of uh, actual results so we see uh, cluster separation so I have actually uh, done uh, this but I can't show you the actual data because uh, I'm not uh, free to share it okay so uh, that's why I'm sharing an abstraction so so we see two different uh, clusters and we are quite happy because that's what we expected but as uh, data scientists should we just accept this we don't know what this separation is. there is a separation and our guess is and when we look at it our guess is that it is male and female right so that's what happened to the data set I got I wasn't told anything about the data points when I apply this I got two different clusters and so that's what I thought uh, it must be uh, uh, male and female fetuses so we will just uh, see to uh, we'll just uh, try to color it by using uh, the, the principal component so, okay. is everyone uh, familiar with principal components if not okay so I will uh, describe it uh, in, a, in a very simple way I'll, I'll try to describe it so when we have a lot of dimensions uh, we can uh, we, so we have multiple dimensions say like two dimensions and when we look at our data we can see uh, possible alternations of these dimensions so let's see we have uh, our dimensions like this x and y we can see how we can change these uh, dimensions not the dimension but the dimension so we can like change our axes right and we can change our axes in such a way that our axis is on the uh, it corresponds with the most variation of the data so um, this uh, now it's fine it's fine I was looking for a marker but yeah. it's all right. I'll, I'll try to explain it again. So, if we have a data set like this, and if we have all our data in, along this axis, if we change our axis to here, that's where the most variation is, right? And looking at what varies the most can be a good insight into data. And that variation could be uh, one of the most important factors when we look at the differences between the data points. So, so we got that uh, first principal component and we looked at the values along it and we colored it. And it gave us like this completely separated color. So that means uh, if we got the principal component, some of the data was around here while others are on the other side so that means oh, that principal component is uh, it's something very important to the data it, it, it can uh, help us separate this data set and uh, what happened was after I did this analysis uh, uh, I got the actual data the real life data behind this uh, uh, and I got to know that uh, so some of it was male and some of it was female but there were like a couple of dots which did not belong to that clusters and that is also something important when we look at uh, biology but uh, when we look at, look at uh, biology from a computer science point of view it's not about getting the absolute truth out of the data it's about getting some, some insight which makes sense and there's always space for errors 
there will be more, more errors than you are comfortably used to as a computer scientist or an engineer. So, but if it makes a little bit more sense about us and humans or the world around us, that's something which is important. So, that's why we uh, continue to do this. So, this was a, uh, a simple, uh, I, I wouldn't use simple, but it was a uh, interesting application of uh, computer science and engineering into biology, which did not require much biological knowledge. And, and this, the, the knowledge uh, about biology I used in uh, solving this problem was not something which was hard to grasp or which needed years of education. I could just go into Wikipedia and look, uh, check all oh, like which region is uh, chromosome X and chromosome Y and I did that and these uh, colorations corresponded to the chromosome Y because that's the, that's the difference between uh, males and females. Uh, females only have two X chromosomes and males have X and Y. So uh, that's how I got to know that this is the actual uh, way to differentiate the sexes in fetuses. So any questions on uh, this part? <coughs> this sort of samples? So uh, these samples could be just taking uh, like uh, a blood sample from the veins because that blood sample in a pregnant woman would have 10% of DNA from the baby and yes so we need so to determine the sex of one fetus we need already like a lot of samples and after we have that necessary number of samples then we can uh, just get another one and uh, apply <coughs> dimensionality reduction and then it's a very easy way of uh, just a very simple calculation. Any other questions? Uh, okay, so I have a third part as well, which is uh, my actual research. It is, it can be a little bit uh, complicated, so I will try to explain it. Hopefully, you will understand. If not, uh, Please always ask questions. So, this is about microbiology. So, first when we talked about biology, that was about ev every form of uh, bioorganism in the world. But when we talk about uh, microbiology, we are talking about uh, bacteria, uh, some sort of uh, some uh, fungi, and some uh, viruses. So, what is the challenge with these things? What do you think is the challenge when we deal with bacteria, fungi, and virus rather than dealing with the uh, human? They are small, we can't even see them. And what did I say earlier? What, what, if we can't see it, what shall we do? We have to look for a tool or a way to find a way to see that indire indirectly. So bacteria, uh, for example, I, as this uh, cartoon says, the human microbiome project says the human body has 100 trillion microscopic life in us. So basically in my body there's 100 trillion bacterial beings and do you know that it is more than the number of cells which actually belongs to me. So there are more microscopic, microscopic living organisms in our body than our own cells. So they, they are very important for uh, our life. So, and this quote, one sometimes finds what one is not looking for. It's a quote by Alexander Fleming who actually discovered penicillin, the first ever antibiotic, which changed the world because we, that was the first instance where we actually tried to change the microbiome 
in our bodies. And now we do it all the time. And uh, antibiotics and probiotics is uh, like such a hot topic these days. Probably you have heard of uh, antibiotic resistance, and maybe you have heard of probiotic uh, yogurts. And uh, there's like so many things with good bacteria for you, which like which will help your gut, which will help your digestion. So it's all these things out there. So how do we make this claim that? Provided yogurt is good for you. How do we know that? And uh, taking uh, amoxicillin, for example, helps us uh, uh, get better from some illnesses, from bacterial infections. So, how do we know this? This is what this part is about. So, this is uh, some interesting images I chose because this all represents where bacteria lives. This is a picture of the human gut. The most important bacteria for humans live there in our stomachs. It helps digestion, it helps break, break down uh, the nutrition for us. And if you don't have the bacteria in there, we will not be able to live. And so is for plants. Uh, the plant roots have bacteria in them. And that's how the plants get their nutrition. So, what is uh, studying about the root microbiome is very important for agriculture. And this is a picture of a coral. And maybe uh, you have heard that most corals are dying. And corals are very important for fish and oceanic life. And actually, uh, my uh, co supervisor, uh, Dr. Tan, works with uh, corals. He he actually looks at the microbiome in the corals and how we can use our knowledge to give maybe probiotics to the corals to save the corals. And actually, clouds also have uh, bacteria in them. And flowers, they also have bacteria. And this is an astronaut. And why do I have that picture there? Because we are interested in knowing how. Uh, these bacteria work in different situations. Are the pro like do probiotics we take at home? Is this going to work in space? If humans are to live in another planet, do we have to find new uh, bacterial uh, friends for us? So these are all questions which we need answers, and biologists alone cannot do this. We, we as uh, computer scientists and engineers need to help with answering these questions. So what are the, uh, some, okay, it's not the slide I was expecting. Uh, let me look at it. Okay, okay, so I'll quickly go through this slide. Uh, this, uh, this is about why we need to use uh, data-driven methods when we look at uh, uh, microbiology. So one thing is that this next generation sequence, for example, this Illumina sequencing machine, it can sequence data rapidly. And we end up with a lot of information, a lot of data. And who do we call when, when we have a lot of data? We call data scientists to come and help understand that data. Right? And also, they are complex data. And what did we see from uh, our examples before? If the data is too complex for us to figure out something, uh, if we need to find out hidden patterns, that's again when uh, we become useful to figure out the patterns uh, and model them. And also, if we don't have uh, data scientists there, we'll have to go to the uh, alternative of experimentally seeing what's happening. So we'll have to just like uh, maybe isolate two bacteria and put them together to see what happens. And But the problem is we have hundreds and thousands of bacteria and we simply cannot do that. And some bacteria cannot live in isolation. And these things cannot simply be done in a lab alone. But for biologists, uh, experimental validation is their golden uh, validation uh, method. But it, it is not practical to do that all the time. Uh, but 
uh, data driven methods are more fast and cost effective because we just need computers while labs need physical space, people to work in the labs and it takes a lot of time so it, it, it's very costly and not, not practical but data driven methods are fast and cost effective. Anyway, this is the interesting slide. Uh, when we investigate microbial in interactions, what are we looking for? So the first is who is there? So we get a microbial sample. For example, uh, uh, you get a, what can I say? You get a skin sample, and we are interested in to see like what kind of microbials are there. How do we do that? So like humans, micro, microbial organisms also have uh, DNA, bacteria has DNA, so we do DNA sequencing which is, uh, which is uh, actually a to topic for another talk but what happens in a sequencing machine is it, it, it uh, gives us the different sequences of DNAs, the different coding of bacteria available in that sample. And for example, uh, it's all. Uh, I'm not sure whether bacterial DNA is uh, also ACTG, but let's say one, two, three, four, or something like that. And we have one sequence saying one, two, three, four, and another sequence saying like five, six, seven. And we have a lot from one, two, three, four, and a little bit of five, six, sevens. What do we know? We have one type of bacteria which is. Uh, prominent in that sample and another secondary type which is not that prominent and that itself is a very good find because uh, we know that uh, in our skin sample there were two bacteria of which one was prominent and let's say if that was uh, unhealthy uh, if, we, if we got some uh, problem with the skin then that's how we that's why we did the DNA uh, sequencing for the bacteria and we found that, that in unhealthy skin this uh, bacteria is uh, prominent and then we can see uh, how it is in healthy skin and maybe we can see that it's the other way around and now we know what might have caused the issue and so this is why it is important to know who is there and what are they doing because bacteria is not just living. For example, like if you look at the wildlife, we can see that they interact together. So, simple example: cats eat mice, and my, mice. I think they also eat the smaller insects. I'm not sure, but we know that. Uh, well, we don't know. Uh, biologists know that. But that's how uh, uh, animals work. There is a food chain and uh, we probably maybe you have heard of uh, these uh, stories where they introduced a specific species to an environment and it completely changed so for example uh, uh, one, a, a very good example is in, in Australia there is this um, species called the cane toads they have been introduced from elsewhere and uh, the problem is cane toads had uh, predators in their original land but in Australia they don't have any predators so what happens when you don't have predators somewhere the population rapidly grows so if we get that uh, analogy into microbiology uh, there could be predator predatory bacteria and uh, <coughs> <laughs> some sort of an arrangement which keeps things balanced and you go somewhere else say you go to I don't know you go to Australia and you find a, a bacteria which was not there in your body and now what will what will happen that bacteria might not have predator so it will grow and it will unbalance the things so that is how some bacteria in infections come to be and so this is it's important for us to know what they are doing there and how will they respond? Uh, mostly to external stimuli. So this basically explains uh, antibiotics and probiotics. And 
this is uh, what I am trying to find answers to in my research um, to see how bacteria interact in their communities. I am looking at mostly uh, gut bacteria samples. So, uh, fortunately, I don't have to look at the gut bacteria samples, which means uh, faces. So I just get the numbers. So I, I get the numbers of uh, like sequences saying, uh, oh, this, bac this much bacteria was present today. This was the constitution of a, of a fecal uh, sample from this person today. And then tomorrow it changed. And next day it changed again. So I look at this data and try to find out what has been going on there. So I think I'm sort of running out of time. So I will uh, skip a couple of slides. Uh, okay. okay, so this has been uh, uh, one of the things I did. So, uh, abundance profile, let me explain it to you. Abundance profile is the constitution of uh, the bacteria in fecal samples. So, this is a timeline. These different colors represent different amounts of bacteria present there, right? So what I'm looking at is uh, how a single person's bacteria composition change. Uh, I think this particular sample is a very nice sample, which goes until like one and a half years. So how that person's bacteria change through uh, one and a half years. And what are we interested in knowing? We are interested to know what has been going on there? How has the bacteria interacted with, e with each other? So this is what we're trying to find out. Uh, MINs, which stands for microbial interaction networks. So microbes basically form a network where they attack each other, they help each other, and all kinds of relationships. So. Um, so this is what we wanted to know, and this is what we had. But the problem with microbiology was, say, I, I came up and said, OK, bacteria A eats bacteria B, and bacteria B eats bacteria C. Likewise, I say something. And like lucky me, I, no one can uh, say, oh, you, you're wrong, because no one knows what's actually happening. Because we can't observe uh, bacteria eating each other or fighting each other, we can't observe that. We know that it happens in some way. So the problem is, oh, how do we know that it's the correct answer? So what I did was I used this Lotka Volterra model. It is a computation model used for uh, normal animals, like macrobiology. For It has been used for uh, wildlife uh, reserve kinds of places and uh, also uh, not oceanic but uh, a marine uh, <coughs> biology systems on how uh, fish interact so how different kinds of fish interact with each other so I thought maybe I, I will use that model to recreate that uh, abundance profile I found and <coughs> When I first recreated it, so I started with the random initiation and recreated it, and it looked very bad. So what do we do? We look at these two, and we look at how similar or dissimilar it was. So this was, uh, uh, this was a very basic, uh, uh, I call it uh, a genetic algorithm, where we went back and evolved this uh, interaction network a little bit. So we looked at these two, found out it was different. So we went back and made, a, made some little changes and looked at it again. And when we did this for like thousand or like 10,000 10, times or so, we found out an answer here, which gives exactly, not exactly that, but very similar. So 
my my results were on like 85 percent similar which in biology is quite good in engineering it's 85 percent accuracy is very bad but in microbial uh, in microbial uh, communities that is quite good so uh, we published this in a in a, in a journal uh, called uh, uh, Biomed Central BMC Bioinformatics and uh, that's uh, that's one thing I have been working on yeah. so I think I have around two minutes of time so I will quickly go to uh, another slide also this is some uh, interactions I found and Uh, I don't want to be too boring yeah. either, so I will try to finish on that. Yeah. Thank you. So this has been uh, some of the interactions I found from that uh, blood data set I was talking about, uh, from a feces of a human. So it was fe fe fecal microbial, microbial samples from a human male and we found these interactions has been happening there. And it has been uh, reported in literature that this these uh, interactions have been happening in mice, and maybe uh, you know that mice apparently have uh, a very similar system to humans. That's why uh, <coughs> scientists always uh, experiment on mice, and these have been uh, reported <coughs> in uh, mice, probably uh, mice feces. This. Uh, interactions and we were able to uh, come up with uh, the same in uh, human samples and I will quickly show something else this is the interesting work I'm working on now before I assumed that these interaction networks remained the same so if I said microbial uh, bacteria A it's bacteria B it remains the same but now I'm trying to investigate whether these keep changing because bacteria are known to change quite a lot and this is uh, my research on uh, finding out changing microbial interactions and I will uh, skip a couple more slides and come here and this is where actually I cluster in Connects with uh, my my uh, problem. So when I looked at those uh, changing microbial interactions, I found out that there were two main clusters on how how these interactions behave. So uh, these these are like like preliminary clues. Uh, we don't know much about it yet, but this suggests that. When we look at microbial interactions, there should be two types. So this is just like uh, the example we looked at with the uh, human fetus. So, but there we know that uh, if there are two types of fetuses, they must be male and female. But here we don't have enough knowledge to like pinpoint. Oh, like this interaction set is this, and the other set is this. We we don't know what to say. About it, so that's what I'm uh, attempting to model these days. To model these two clusters separately to see uh, how that can help. Hopefully, that will help in finding antibiotics or probiotics or something. And also, uh, I will go into my one of my last slides where some uh, next steps I've been thinking about. So we know that bacteria changes with the seasons they change during the day and night so some bacteria are more active during the day some more active in the night and like humans they also depend on nutrition and bacteria thrive in a nutrition rich environment and when they don't have enough nutrition they behave in different ways and we know that uh, like even some animals when uh, they don't have enough nutrition they have uh, biological ways of uh, like saving themselves for example hibernation and also uh, 
if I'm to get an example from uh, Australia, when kangaroos are pregnant and when they don't have enough food, what happens? The, the kangaroo has the ability to uh, reverse the pregnancy and get the fetus back into its body. So, if, if, uh, so it, biology is a very interesting field. Right? So, especially microbiology, there are, there are so many kinds of bacteria, so many different things could happen. So, we want to, we want to get like, some insights on what's happening there. And that's how uh, engineers can help in uh, biology to make sense of complex systems by, by looking at data and trying to find what is hidden, trying to find the patterns. And yes, that is uh, the end of my talk. And thank you very much. Yes. So uh, in uh, in data science, so different people use different platforms. So I, I prefer to use just Python code. Sometimes, uh, sorry? no, OpenCV would be for uh, computer vision kind of problems. Uh, I use uh, I use Scikit-learn or Pandas. It's very important for data science. Uh, Python has a lot of uh, Flexibility and also R is a good programming language for data science. It's mostly numbers, so uh, so you you just need to see, see look at the numbers from a different point of view. Um, yeah, I'm happy to take uh, more questions. Yes, any or you can uh, like ask me after the talk as well. Thank you. So, good evening to everyone. So, it's with my great pleasure to uh, express my sincere gratitude to our ISM president, secretary, and my dear colleagues. So, I would like to thank uh, engineer Rajit for his immense knowledge and delivering uh, uh, the lecture to our engineering society. Also, I would like to thank uh, our section committee who has arranged this session for the public lecture uh, and my sincere thanks to all of you who have been participating from this event. So thanks once again Rajit. So Thank I you. believe that uh, so Hemon also will have the self uh, reversing pregnancy. <laughs> so that so if they are not capable they will be able to do it. <laughs> thank you so much. Thank you for your immense knowledge and thank you for your contribution to the Sri Lanka. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much for that. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, that one's a unity dynamics model. So that is a, that is another model which I uh, used to uh, evolve the uh, answer, uh, evolve the solution. Okay, so it's, uh, yeah, it's a community model on how uh, so ways of uh, modeling a community. So we know that in bacterial communities, there's a higher uh, heterogeneity. Some bacteria are more influential than the others. Yeah. So I, I've included that model so that we stay we stay true to. 
these characteristics of the battery will make while uh, modeling the interactions. And those, um, the visualization really just shows you, is it like how often this appears with the other? Yeah, like how, how often uh, they appear to uh, influence each other, I would say. And influencing what way? Because influencing means if we see uh, an increase of one population uh, after the other population has been increased, so that could mean or like if A increases, B might increase. Okay. something. So then, like yeah, because we, we can't get yeah, correlation is, because we can't uh, look at it directly. So we try to find uh, all kinds of ways of looking at it. I see. And you look at that over over the whatever time. Yeah, over the time, and we look at it yeah. to see whether it has been uh, happening throughout the time. Yeah, it's a true interaction. Very fascinating. So which which level are you studying at? Level two. Yeah. So I was just sort of doing a lot of uh, like uh, scrap boxes like what's that? This things to this this other platform. Very bad Kegel. Kegel. Yeah. So do some kind of calculation uh, so that you can understand how different data sets are. Because as I said, the data is all about trying to find out what has been going on there. So it's like looking at data, you can't see anything, but we have to convert it into a format where we can see something. So do the most, like a lot of kinds of things. Thank you. 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 Thank you.